Good morning. Good morning. How many of you are thinking about becoming scientists? Oh, come on. That's all? <laughs> you don't know what you're missing. Maybe you'll find out. Well, I do want to talk to you. Excuse me for standing up, but I do a lot of public speaking. I'm in the habit of standing up, so that's what I will do. I wanted to talk to you about who can become a scientist and what it means to be a scientist and what it means to be a scientist who is driven to write. One of the first pieces of advice I want to give you is that if you, be, if, if you choose to work as a journalist, be very careful because that's the only thing anyone will ever remember about you. <laughs> I've worked, um, can, is this on? Okay. I guess I'm at the wrong height. Okay. I give up. <laughs> I've worked um, most of my life as either a musician or a scientist, um, been an oboist, a classical music announcer. I've also um, worked as a laboratory technician, cancer laboratory, animal laboratory, and worked in a psychiatric emergency department, and I've also worked managing a poison center. But all anybody seems to remember about me is that I've worked as a journalist. <laughs> um, so be very careful. It's a label that attaches to you and that you will never be able to shake off. I also trained as an ethicist, and it was really valuable training in more ways than one, because I always knew I would be a scientist. I always was fascinated with science, but I also was always passionate about writing and hoped that I'd find one day a way to combine the two. Um, the interesting thing that I learned on the way to combining the two is that it's very important to be judicious about the advice that you take. You can get excellent advice and you can get terrible advice. And a large part of your education is learning to discern what's good advice for you and what is not so good advice. So through a combination, I did find a way to combine science and writing. Um, but to return to the question of who can be a scientist, it's a very important question, more important than you know. And I'm not comfortable talking about my own goals, but there's one real important message I want to give you, so I'm going to share this. When I was 17 years old, I began university, I had taken all P AP science courses, gotten fives, National Merit Scholar, the whole bit, and I was determined to become a physician. But all of my advisors and all of my professors told me in 1969 that that was an unrealistic goal. They said that there were no black women physicians. They were wrong, of course, but I had, didn't know they were wrong because I had never met one. And they dissuaded me. They said, oh, you're good in English, be a writer, which I was and which I really enjoyed, so I did become a writer. But in retrospect, it's clear to me what, how bad a piece of advice that was. What's also clear to me is how it was predicated on people's ideas about who can and who cannot become a scientist. What does a scientist look like? You know, what gender is he? You know, uh, what sort of preparation does he have? Does he have money? Does he not have money? What did his parents do? Um, how does he dress? All these things sound so trivial. But it's important to remember that scientists, like everybody else, are people. Science itself is pure, we're told, and objective, we're told. And science itself has no character or personality. But the people who practice it do. And the people who are the gatekeepers of science also have their personalities and their biases and their preferences and their preconceptions about who, or who cannot, can or cannot become a scientist. Um, I think that what's really important is that only you can judge whether you are in the mold or not. And it's extremely important if you decide that you are, if you decide that you've never lost that sense of wonder that children have, if you decide that you have this relentless quest to get to the truth of things and you're not satisfied with the answers other people give you, if you decide that nothing makes you happier than unraveling a mystery, and using the skills you've acquired and knowledge you've acquired about mathematics and scientists to do that, then you're a scientist and you can't let anyone tell you differently. It doesn't matter how much money you have, doesn't matter what school you went to, doesn't matter if you finished school. You're a scientist and you're not going to be happy unless you're true to yourself there. Who is a scientist is very often what I call forbidden knowledge. If you go back to the claim I was made by everyone unilaterally at my university in 1969 that there were no black female physicians and heaven knows there are black, no, no black female scientists. Well, it sounds so absurd to us today, but that was a conventional wisdom of the day. Um, of course, they were wrong, but 
The facts were hidden from us. The facts were edited out of the science books. Even if you go back to the night, go back to that year and look for women scientists, who do you see? Marie Curie. Period. There were other women scientists. Um, who discovered the structure of DNA? James Watson, Francis Crick, Maurice Wilkins, and who else? She didn't win the Nobel Prize, but it could not have been discovered without the work of Rosalind Franklin. If you read James Watson's um, memoir of discovering the structure of DNA, you will see that he refers to Rosalind Franklin quite disrespectfully throughout his book. They laughed at her, they called her Rosie. Instead of discussing her scientific um, prowess and her data, which they stole, they talk about the fact that she needed to wear more lipstick and do her hair. They were making decisions about who could and could not be a scientist. And so were all the people who ignored her when time came to apportion the glory for the... So this kind of information is part of what you need to become a scientist. You need, of course, training. You need to know math. You need to know science. That's clear. But you also need something else. You need to be willing, in fact, you need to be eager to go beyond conventional wisdom and find out the truth of things. And you need to be a person who is not dissuaded when people tell you that information doesn't exist. Because sometimes it doesn't exist, sometimes it hasn't happened, but very, very often, in fact, shockingly often, it's forbidden knowledge. It's information that is there, but nobody wants to acknowledge it. This happens all the time. It happens around um, things other than race and gender issues, but it happens all the time, and it's really important not to be dissuaded. In fact, I'm at the point now that when someone declares a little too passionately, a little too loudly, that something isn't true, that's my cue to look into it and find out if it's true. <laughs> and I'm rarely disappointed. Um, when I determined to write my book, it was because I was working in a hospital running a poison control center, and kidney transplantation was um, relatively new in the early 1970s. Uh, university of Pennsylvania had done this, the first one in, in the 1960s. And um, my university, um, I had militated to get more room for our poison center, and we got it. We expanded into something that used to belong to the radiology department. I was looking at an old file cabinet, trying to open the drawer so I could use it, and I found old files littering the bottom of the cabinet from 1970s. These files were of people who were being considered for kidney transplants. They needed, they were, if they didn't have kidneys, they were going to die. But this is on the novel technology. And I quickly realized that some of the files were fat. They were filled with test results, sociological assessments, um, all kinds of, you know, very detailed medical histories and um, details about insurance, etc. All information necessary to qualify someone for a life-saving kidney transplant. A few of the files were very thin, only one or two papers in them. And as I looked to them, I was shocked to realize that the thin files were those of the black patients. I found two files were almost identical, describe almost identical people. Both of these gentlemen were older, they had insurance, they were retired, and they'd had a surprisingly similar um, tailspin as their kidneys failed. But the file of the white gentleman was thick, full of reams and reams of tests, and the medical staff, when you read the notes, the, the notes were not dispassionate. The medical staff went on and on about his determination, his loving family, you know, his determination to live and they documented these her her Herculean efforts trying to get him a kidney. The thin file had one line, and that line read, our plan for this patient is to help him prepare for his imminent demise. It was signed by a physician that I knew. I knew this person as a kind person, an arrogant person. I was completely shocked, and it galvanized me. From that moment, I knew I was going to write my book, because although no one was talking about healthcare disparities then, I knew they existed. And as I studied, me I studied um, basic medical science, because it was really important for me to be able to assess what I read for myself and not have to have it interpreted by someone else. And I studied medical ethics during my medical ethics program, three years at Harvard Medical School, and innumerable conferences during which I spoke with people at other universities, both here and abroad. And I spoke to experienced medical ethicists and people who were um, 
had detailed information, in fact, entire careers in the history of medicine. And I asked them what they knew about the history of African Americans in medical research. Had they been treated differently? Had they been subjected to unconscionable research? Everyone told me the same thing I had been told in 1969. There's nothing there. Nothing happened. Tuskegee, that's it. These are the people who would know. They were experts. Some of them had spent 30, 40 years studying the history of American medicine. And I could have said, well, that's it then. There's nothing there. But at this point, I knew enough to say, this is my cue to start digging. And digging I did, and I found, unfortunately, reams and reams of information. But information was really important to me. But also what was really important to me was discussing the culture of medicine. We have a um, belief, a carefully inculcated belief in this country, actually in most countries, that science and medicine are objective that they're objective and they're fair, that um, emotions don't come into it, that um, evidence-based medicine, determinations are based um, solely upon facts. And that's not true. It's absolutely not true because medicine and science are practiced by people. People carry their biases and their um, minor injustices and even their blind myopia, their un inability to understand that the paradigm that they're using to understand information is too narrow. They carry all those things with them and they use those to interpret the data. So, what as a scientist, you, what you should strive for is breaking out of those narrow paradigms, those narrow boxes. If everyone has looked at events in a certain way, has looked at a population in a certain way, has looked at a data set or um, disease progression in a certain way, What's really going to be key to your being successful and breaking new ground is your ability to look beyond that and to apply your own personality, your own questions, and your own assessments using your own culture. And what I'm urging you to do is to understand that science needs to be, become wider. And the fact that you don't fit that profile of who can be a scientist you know, that you're not that product of a suburban home, white male with money and a pedigree of fathers and grandfathers who also have been scientists. The fact that you don't fit that profile actually can make you much more valuable to science because you are, it's going to be easier for you, if you choose to, to take a wider look and ask questions and question conventional knowledge and question forbidden knowledge, probe beyond this, beyond, below the surface and add immensely to the richness of our scientific and medical knowledge. Thank you.